welcome to those of you who have joined us. Welcome to the Home and Energy Chats webinar series and our episode dedicated to home energy efficiency and how to get started. My name is Heather Chandler and I am the owner and publisher of Green and Healthy Maine Homes. We have a great presentation for you tonight and I am looking forward to learning together with you. Um, because I have a bit of a cold and I'm afraid I'm losing my voice, I am at this point going to turn it over to Rain, who is going to do some sponsor thank you. So take it away, Rain. Hi. I'm Oops. Sorry. We would like to start by sharing a special thank you to our sponsors, including our fall season sponsor, Seneca Construction Services. Now offering net zero ready design and build packages located in Pownal just minutes from Freeport, Brunswick, and Portland. And now a word from our presenting sponsor, Royal River Heat Pumps. Hi, I'm Scott Libby, owner of Royal River Heat Pumps. A long time ago, the Royal River, like most rivers, was an important part of life, powering mills and allowing a community to grow and flourish. Nowadays, we see what a river can help to create. We believe that ordinary people can come together to make a big difference too. This year, Royal River Heat Pumps will invest our advertising dollars into a new campaign we've launched called Ripple to River. Each month, we'll choose a different nonprofit organization whose focus is kids battling childhood illnesses. We'll tell you about their particular mission and let you know how you can help support them. We're also launching an online resource at rippletoriver.com, providing information and a link for donations. Little things can turn into big change. I'm Scott Libby from Royal River Heat Pumps in Freeport, and I hope you'll join us in making change happen for kids and families that are facing challenges that nobody ever wants to face. Visit rippledariver.com to learn more and donate, and thank you. Thank you to all of our Home and Energy Chat sponsors. So a quick overview of the evening. We are going to begin the webinar with a presentation from each of our panelists. And then we're gonna open it up to Q&A following the presentations. We've received a couple of questions through the registration process. And if you have others now, or as you hear from our presenters, please submit them using the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. And we will try our best to get to them all. A reminder that this webinar is being recorded and will be uploaded to our website, greenmainhomes.com. If you are unfamiliar with us, Green and Healthy Maine Homes is dedicated to inspiring healthy, efficient, and future-ready Maine homes. Through a quarterly print magazine, the annual Green Home and Energy Show, an online business directory, the monthly e-newsletters, and an active social media presence, we share expert advice to inspire healthy, comfortable, efficient, and sustainable Maine homes. Please visit greenmainhomes.com to learn more. And now it is my pleasure to introduce our panelists for the evening. Richard Burbank is an energy advisor and the president and CEO of Evergreen Home Performance, which he founded in 2006. He is passionate about educating homeowners on energy efficiency, and he takes an active role in ongoing education and mentoring of the Evergreen staff. It was his own efforts to insulate and improve his 1880s Rockland home that inspired the company. Richard serves on the board of Efficiency First, a national home performance contractor trade group, and actively advocates for federal and state energy efficiency policy. Andy Meyer is a senior program manager at Efficiency Maine. His responsibilities include residential weatherization, heating systems, appliances, and lighting. He has inspected hundreds of homes, was certified by the Building Performance Institute as a building analyst, is certified to handle heat pump refrigerant, and he also has a bachelor's degree from Bowdoin College. Welcome, Richard and Andy. At this point, I'll turn it over to Richard, who is going to kick off the presentations. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Um, Andy and I have known each other for a long time, and you're in good hands with Andy. Um, and and we've, we've met ahead of time, so we can coordinate uh, this presentation tonight. So we're very excited to, uh, to talk to you tonight. Um, the portion of the presentation I'm covering is uh, talking about how to evaluate your home uh, uh, to, and uh, make energy efficiency improvements while also taking into consideration important prep work to ensure your home is also safe, healthy, 
durable and structural, structurally sound. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the process of how we do it. And so, and I'm going to give you a few tips and things that you can start with right now just to get ready for it, as well as I'll share a couple of stories of some actual houses that we've improved uh, in two phases. So it's kind of interesting going through the process of how do homeowners figure out, well, what do I do with this big old house? And what do I do first? And what do I do? What do I, what do, I do second? Uh, I'm going to leave plenty of room for, for questions at the end. Uh, so uh, without further ado, uh, let me go to the first slide. So first of all, I, I want to cover what this term home performance is. Um, it doesn't get the airplay that weatherization does, and we're often talking about the same thing. But it really is a comprehensive approach to identifying and fixing comfort and efficiency problems in a home. And I don't want to make this sound medical, but it is almost like medicine. You, you have to diagnose uh, the house to figure it out. Um, medicine didn't always diagnose. It used to be that if you had asthma, you had gout or whatever, there was always the same solution. And I won't mention what it was because um, it involves, well, leeches, you know, <laughs> you don't want to hear about leeches. Leeches solves everything. They didn't diagnose back then, but now medicine is about diagnosis. Otherwise, it's malpractice. Um, but there's a lot of things that are pretty straightforward in, in home performance. Um, kind of like in food, it's not a bad thing to eat kale. It's not a bad thing in health to go for a walk. So there's a lot of these things there that are very, very easy that you know, eat more kale, walk more. That's usually a good thing. Um, but in this process with a home, um, it can be quite overwhelming a little bit, but it's actually easy because there's so many ways to start. It only gets hard when you're looking for that last bit of fossil fuel you're trying to eliminate. But, uh, but one of the things that I always use when I'm looking at a really confusing old or newer house trying to advise uh, a homeowner and they have all these questions, it's always good to kind of start with the basics. Um, as a foundation, you want the home to be safe. You don't want anyone to get hurt to make your home efficient or to get killed. You know, it makes sense. But there are some things to, to watch out for. Um, health. Um, an example of, of health is uh, a lot of times drafts um, can cause efficiency problems, comfort problems, but sometimes they lift the radon out of the house. So if you have pre-existing radon in the house or unbeknownst to you, there's radon in your water. And every time you shower, there's radon all around you along with that nice refreshing hot water. It's really good to incorporate that into your improvement. And finally, comfort. If you're gonna be in a house, you might as well be comfortable, right? Otherwise you just live outside. Um, and you also uh, need to make sure that the house will last the life of the mortgage at least. So durability is really important. Composting is really awesome. It's really green when it's food scraps, but not when it's your basement, not when it's your sill. Um, so finally, we get to efficiency. And so when you call someone that does this for a living, um, they already try to take care of all that stuff. So they try to make it super easy. So it's really good to go to Efficiency Maine's website, find a registered vendor, and they know all about this stuff. But just know that that's got to be in the back of everyone's mind. You don't want to kill anyone, hurt them, make them sick. You don't want them shivering in the dark, <laughs> and you don't want their house rotting. And then you can get to efficiency, and then you can get to green and fighting climate change. So in the energy analysis, um, there's a lot of different parts, but probably the most important part of all is the interview with you, the homeowner. And for you, this is one thing you can write down that you can do is get clear on what your vision for your house is. Get clear. There's so many right answers. So it's hard to fail in the beginning, but don't hold back. If you wanna eliminate all fossil fuels, there's way to, ways to do it. It's not super cheap, but you can figure out things to do. Um, if it's you're expecting your first child and their bedroom is cold in the winter and hot in the summer. Maybe you can start there and cocoon your little baby with, with, with comfort. Um, if you have respiratory issues and you have a basement that looks like that basement under indoor air quality check on the bottom of that slide, you know that's really important to consider. So it really depends on all these different factors. So it's really important for you to get clear on what your priority is before you meet with someone to talk about it. 
Um, is it fuel consumption? What have you? But in the energy analysis, um, with uh, that efficiency main requires for all the air leakage reduction, you go through the steps of, you know, doing an infrared analysis, which is cool diagnostics, a blower door test, which tests the air leakage. Combustion safety, again, one of those safety health things. You don't want to have exhaust coming into your house unbeknownst to you. Um, and indoor air quality, you know, indoor air quality is really, really important. So that's the priority for humans, that prior slide. But in, in the, the science that we're wrestling with is physics, chemistry, biology, and we're wrestling with heat, moisture, and air flows. And uh, that's what we're keeping in mind. And more and more, as you get more and more efficient moisture, controlling moisture, making sure that it's not too much, um, it, as you reduce the heat flow, which dries out these old wet buildings that were built 200 years ago with a wet basement, you know, all that heat going through dried it out. And all that air, all that draftiness dried it out. And if you don't do anything about the moisture in the basement, um, or the teenager that takes too many showers that doesn't turn on the bathroom fan, or maybe you don't have a bathroom fan. Before you fill that attic full of insulation, let's put a bathroom fan in. So there's a lot of things to organize around that. So that's, that's a really important touch point, both the priorities of safety, health, comfort, and juggling the balls of heat, air, and moisture. And, um, one thing that a lot of main homes, whether they're newer like mine, uh, built within the last 20 years or old, basement air is usually the primary air duct coming into our house, especially into the winter due to the physics. Warm air rises, cold air comes in. Um, when I started my career 16 years ago in the mid coast, there's a lot of really old houses and there's a lot of spiders and their webs in the, in the corners of the basements because they know where the air is flowing and, uh, and the air coming into the house is coming past those spiders. So it's really important for indoor air quality and controlling airflow, especially in a tall building that you prevent that from happening. And if you do a really good job with new windows and tightening up your house and weather stripping and caulking, it's like a bell jar sitting over your basement. So your, your basement is an inconvenient truth. It's underneath you, you have to take care of it. And if it's dirt, an encapsulation is, is a potential solution. Uh, and uh, for older houses, this is a big, big consideration. So think about your health here. This is where I don't recommend tightening up a house unless you really control the things that could rot the house or affect your, your health. But after you've taken care of the basement, managed the moisture and the air coming in, um, we have to look at the, at the attic where the air is flowing. And because it's way up high, there's more stack effect pushing air out. And that's where you can have uh, a problem in that there's all this old insulation sitting there and this worker, uh, Steve Ather, and he's been with us since 2008. And uh, he's expertly finding those leaks and sealing them with foam uh, underneath all that insulation. In most cases, houses already have insulation. It's just, it's just not fully lined up with the air leakage. Um, so we wanna seal the top and insulate and uh, sidewalls um, we eventually get to um, oftentimes, but because they're somewhere in the middle, you see those arrows, how long those arrows indicate the level of force. So hypothetically at a certain point in time, there's no air flowing in or out at certain times. It depends on the day, the wind and all that other stuff. But in the middle of the building, you don't have as much stack effect pressure. One of my first years working in this field, for some reason, an engineer at Maine Medical Center called me when their new wing was installed in their emergency room area. And they, they weren't tight. And it's six floors. And each floor is like 12 or 14 feet high. And they had uncontrolled air leakage coming into the bottom floors as heat was running. So it happens on big, big construction projects. And, uh, and so it can happen to your house. If you have a tall house, it's an issue. Um, uh, solving solving the, the wall insulation, if it is empty, most newer houses should have some wall insulation 
um, installing cellulose is possible through the siding. So, so once you've completed that whole envelope, that's what we call the building envelope. You've got your family surrounded in comfort. You're protecting them from radon in the basement. Um, you're keeping that out. You're protecting them from um, moisture coming up. Uh, so that's, that's the basic concept of the envelope. This is, this is one old house story. So this house, uh, 1800s, um, a little section of it probably was a settler's, a settler's house here, here in Southern Maine. And we have a lot of things going on. If you look over in the top, in, in the top corner, you see that big vent. And the reason why they put that big vent in before is they had lots of ice dams because heat was getting in the attic. And how was heat getting in the attic? Where did that come from? Well, it came from the house, of course, through the stack effect. So, so this was one of the issues that the homeowner was concerned about. All those icicles and ice dams, they were huge. And there was some mold starting to form in the attic. So that was one issue. The other issue is <clears throat> the basement was really gross and really stinky. And the mice loved it. And there were lots of drafts and the floors were cold except for near the heating pipes, which were steam. So here's the attic and guess what? There's insulation in it. But the problem is there's air flowing past it. So it's just like, that's my jacket hanging over there. That's a warm jacket, but it's hanging over there. And that's the same thing with sometimes insulation you see in a house. If it's not between your family in the cold elements or in the summer, a really hot attic, it can flow around. And that's exactly the case in this attic. And look what was happening. There was some mold starting to form because the moisture was coming up from the wet basement, which you'll see later. And as we were fishing around there, there's several layers of insulation, usually you know, through the years, there's just a whole bunch. And just the presence of the insulation thinks you've checked the box, but it's got to be insulation and air tightness together. So it's not as bad as my jacket being way over there, but in some cases it almost is. But sometimes fishing around, look, we found some knob and tube wiring. You can't insulate next to <laughs> knob and tube wiring. This is an old house. So, uh, and then look at the, look at the crawl space. <coughs> Dirt and piles of rocks. Are they mortared together? Should we fix the structure? Um, in this case, we have a, a wrapped up foil covered duct and it's a duct from a heating system. And we have lots of insulation underneath the floor because the floor is freezing cold. Duct tape up and it's falling apart and there's air flowing through it and it's wet and it smells like mildew. Some basements we go into, um, my clothes come out smelling like mildew. It's gross. And that's where the, the air is coming into the house. It's not, it's not really what you want to do. Um, looks like these got shuffled. Where? I'm missing a slide here. All right. I am missing a slide. So, so that's, that's one old house. Now, what they did in this particular case is they started in the attic because the basement was a big project to take on. And they, they did the basement later. And the attic and basement are a really good place to start. And, um, and they're, they've been really happy, less icicles. I try to keep my eyes on the road, but when I drive by their house and a light snow, I'm always looking up there just a little bit, not with my wife in the car, cause she catch me, uh, look up there and see, and see how it's doing. So diagnosing how the air is flowing through the house helps them improve on their fuel bills and their comfort and their indoor air quality. The next house, for some reason in my presentation, I'm not seeing a picture of the house, but picture this. You have a house, it's, uh, it's a very large house, three stories high. The top floor has a playroom. Um, the master bedroom is in the wing over the garage. And this is one of the back wings and this is a side attic side attic. That's one of those low walls, a knee wall, when you go into a bedroom and there's a knee wall. And this house wasn't built that long ago. It probably passed building inspection at the time, probably passed the, uh, the energy code at that time. So you think all these people looked at it, but yet 
when I did an air leakage test on this house, um, which was not an inexpensive house for these clients to purchase. When I did a blower door test, it was two and a half times the Energy Star recommended level. Super leaky. And it was tall and it was big. And guess what? The master bedroom looked really nice, but it didn't feel as nice as it looked. And there was side attics around the master bedroom like this. And below this was, was a garage. And the garage ceiling wasn't fully insulated in the right spot, kind of similar to that jacket, not quite right nestled around me. Um, so this side attic was leaking a lot of air down at the bottom from the, uh, uh, from the roof vents. This is up at the top of a new house. Plenty of insulation up there, but these are all the wiring holes uh, at the top of a wall. I'm looking down after moving the insulation out of the way, and you see the cracks on the top and bottom of the top stud of the framed wall, the top plate it's called. And the cracks often after it's dried out a little bit after a few years, you can take those pocket full of change that you've been carrying around all this time and you can drop pennies and dimes through those cracks. And those are all air leaks coming in from the center of the house in a pretty new house. And then there's really big holes around plumbing stacks. So this is why Efficiency Main has a really generous rebate encouraging you to go up into an attic. Yes, even an attic that was built recently and seal these leaks, which is a lot of work to go through and move all this insulation and then put it all back together again with a nice thick layer of new insulation. Another thing that happens in newer houses, it doesn't look as ugly. This looks quite nice, clean, white, it's not as ugly as that other basement, which people avoid, like the plague, probably. Um, this looks really nice, but look, it's not insulated. And concrete insulates very, very poorly. Um, we have a fully ducted system. All the supply ducts with warm air are at least insulated fairly well, but it's kind of warm down there, but all that heat is leaving out the basement walls. And Efficiency Main has a fantastic rebate for insulating your walls. And this is a big house. So there's a lot of insulation. <clears throat> Everyone knows a double pane window is much better than a single pane window. And a triple pane window is even better. Well, all that concrete is like a single pane of window. And if you insulate it with foam, it's going to be like having a 10, uh, uh, what do you, you're a mathematician, Andy. Well, what's a 10-fold uh, pane window? Uh, uh, a decapane. A decapane, deca yes, a decapane window. Insulating your foundation is like installing a decapane window where there used to be one huge, big, single-pane window. Um, so I've covered some of the ways to keep heat in. Heating systems is a whole other thing. And, you know, just like insulate, oh, just throw some insulation up there, it'll be fine. Well, if it's not done in the right way, it's not gonna work. And same thing with heating systems. Um, but with, uh, with heat pumps, um, they're pretty simple. Um, they're, they're hard to mess up. Uh, and uh, if you can, you can start with using them as a supplement. It, it's a little trickier to start having it do the whole house and you can do it, but you need a good plan to make it all work. And there's a lot of questions around, can I just replace them all with heat pumps? Well, first of all, if you're building new, that's what they're doing. They're just not even putting in a fossil fuel burning device. They're just doing heat pumps and a good envelope and hopefully some good windows and ventilation and they've taken care of it. Um, and uh, the ceiling units, are also another convenient way of, of doing it. We are running across some, some issues sometimes if it's not, if it's put up in those attics and, and hanging out on the backside without any insulation, that doesn't quite work. So those are a little bit trickier, but they're very, very convenient. Upgrading to heat pump water heaters. There are so many oil boilers like the one on the on the side, uh, on the on the right side here. And oil. Um, a little trick for you to pick up uh, to figure out how much you could possibly save. It's not just about the efficiency of heating water. It's about avoiding waste. And heat pumps are amazing at avoiding waste. They do harvest the heat from the basement and they 
help dehumidify the basement, which is usually a very good thing. Um, I did have one client that raised specific rare turtles and needed a very warm environment in his basement room. And so the heat pump in the basement, it didn't quite plan out well. He had to add more heat for the room with the turtle. So if you have a room with the turtles that has to be 85 degrees, you know, plan that out better. <laughs> but in this case, it works really well. But one of the things that you really have to think about though is the heat, the, the, the boiler, sometimes these boilers have trouble being shut off or heating contractors are worried about shutting them off or they won't shut them off. So when you're calculating the potential savings, it's really important to make sure that that boiler can be shut off or turned down or what have you. Because I have run across situations where they're just adding more to the shopping cart. It still burns half a gallon to a gallon per day sitting there idle because it can't be shut off. And then you have this, this super efficient unit trying to harvest as much waste heat coming off of it and getting it into the water. But that's one of the trickiest things. My father-in-law called me with this question. He goes, I could get one of these and then I can get rid of that superstore tank. But it's not, it's not that simple. Um, but if you can work through that, that, that scenario, um, hot, hot water heat pumps are fantastic. And I think, I think that's, I think that's all I have. And I just want to leave more room for, for questions at the end. Thank you so much. Thank you, Richard. That was excellent. And, uh, gives me lots of questions, but I'm going to turn it over at this point to Andy and we will get to Q and A in a few minutes. Thank you, Heather, and thank you, Richard. Richard was too modest to say, but he used to be and remains one of my favorite mentors. He, uh, we've been through many houses together, and I learn, I continue to learn a lot from Richard. So it's a treat to be presenting with him. Um, Rain, let's go ahead to the next slide. Um, as you guys know, I work at Efficiency Maine. Uh, hopefully, folks know us, but if you don't, we're a quasi state agency. We run all the state's energy efficiency programs, so uh, gas, electricity. Uh, propane, natural gas, oil, kerosene, wood. Uh, if it involves energy efficiency, uh, electric vehicles, industrial, commercial, residential, low income, it, it's us. Um, we, we are known for four offerings that I'm going to go over in a little bit of detail, and they are rebates. That's what people most associate with us, and we issue uh, tens of thousands of rebates every year. We offer financing, some informational tools, and we've got a database of hundreds of fantastic independent installers, including Evergreen Home Performance, where Richard works. Um, and we're funded from a bunch of different sources, and um, our executive director reports to a board of directors that is appointed by the governor and confirmed by the legislature. So we're not directly part of the state government. We're more like the main turnpike authority or the main housing authority. Next slide. I said we, talk, we, have, we have four offerings, rebates being the first. Let's go to the next slide and we'll talk about rebates. Um, Richard did a nice job describing heat pumps. That's our most popular rebate right now. We're rebating a heat pump every six minutes. Um, we rebated over 100,000 of them and people love them for two big reasons, other reasons as well, but two primary reasons is they save a lot of money. That's why people put them in. They cost about half the cost of oil or one third the cost of propane. Um, and they love them. The reason they buy more than one is they like the year round comfort. So all the heat pumps that we rebate have five functions. They all can heat. I just mentioned they're very low cost at any temperature. They all have air conditioning. And more and more people are finding that the main climate is shifting to where air conditioning is becoming of interest, where it may not have been 10 years ago. Um, all the heat pumps we rebate have dehumidification mode, which can be really nice in a humid but not scorching hot day. It can make the house very, very comfortable. They all have air filters in them to help reduce the uh, allergen load. Uh, uh, Richard was talking about a healthy home. Um, and they all offer indoor air circulation. I want to be clear on that. That means like ceiling fan function. They do not bring fresh air into the home. And I don't want to confuse anyone when I say it. it's just recirculating indoor airs inside. Um, and there's um, lots of fine print associated with our rebates. But the key points here is 
people of any income can qualify for up to $1,200 worth of rebates for heat pumps. And if people qualify for our low income program, they qualify for $2,400 in rebates. And one of the key fine prints is uh, pieces is that the unit has to be installed by a, a registered vendor. We have over 700 of them. Next slide. I mentioned the $2,400 low income rebate. Um, the formula, to, the, the way to know if you're eligible for that is if you participate in LIHEAP, SNAP, TANF, main care, or your home and property have a combined uh, assessed value up below these thresholds here by these counties. We've got the detail on our website, so I'm not going to go through all of it. But uh, if you're participating in one of these low-income programs or have a qual uh, uh, property assessed value that's eligible, then you're eligible for our enhanced low-income rebates, which are the best we've ever had. Next slide. Richard did a super job talking about insulation. Um, people buy, he, he mentioned probably six or seven reasons. Um, the couple top ones that we hear is uh, reducing heating costs. It also, insulation also reduces cooling costs, but um, heating costs are typically higher in Maine than cooling and increasing year round comfort. Richard talked about that. Uh, drafts, um, cold spots, just uh, can make the house more of it usable, uh, which is nice, especially in these COVID-19 days when we're more and more people are working from home or schooling kids from home. It's nice to make your whole house comfortable. I was raised in a house uh, where we used to huddle near the wood stove and then sprint for sprint for the uh, sprint for bed at the end of the day and hope you could warm up. Uh, uh, with using the blankets. You, you don't have to live like that. You insulate your house, the whole thing could be usable. Um, and the rebates that we offer that Richard referred to are the most generous we have ever had. And there's never been a better time to insulate your house. We offer for everybody in the state of Maine of any income to pay 50% of the project cost up to a $5,000 rebate. So just to be clear, a $10,000 insulation job would cost you $5,000. And if you wanted to finance that, it'd be $53 a month for 10 years. We've never, and that's for any income. And it sounds like a low income program, but that's for everybody. And the low income program is, I can't say it with straight face, we'll pay 90% of the cost up to a $9,000 rebate. So that same example of a $10,000 installation job would cost the homeowner $1,000. And that could be financed for $10.60 a month a $10,000 job. So we've, that's why I'm saying there's never been a better time to insulate your house. And there's a lot of fine print. Um, I'm not gonna go through it all here, but one of the key things is the work has to be done by a residential registered vendor like Evergreen Home Performance. Um, and they, all of them, which are on their website, which I'll show you on efficiencymain.com, um, they know how to navigate to help make sure you get the maximum rebate. So that's the place to start for all of these upgrades. So we talked about heat pumps. We talked about insulation. Let's go to the next slide. Next most popular rebate we have is uh, heat pump water heaters. And we have rebated 50,000 in Maine. Uh, a couple of years ago, one out of every 10 in the country was coming to Maine. Mainers are putting in heat pump water heaters faster than any other type of water heater. And they love them. People actually love their water heaters. That's unusual. We did focus groups years ago. Remember, one person didn't even know she had a water heater. Um, and now people are actually loving their water heaters, which is amazing. And they love them because they make a lot of hot water. They can save uh, average main family $5,000 over their 10-year life. And as Richard mentioned, they help to dehumidify. That's kind of a nice bonus for most main basements. Um, and our incentives um, on heap of water heaters are very, very generous. We have an $850 instant discount. So you walk into the store, buy the water heater, and as you're paying for it, you scan a barcode off your phone and they'll give you an $850 discount. Lowe's changed their pricing today. Um, you can now buy a heat pump water heater for $549 at Lowe's. Um, that's remarkable. That's almost the cheapest heat pump, lowest price heat pump water heater, or lowest price water heater in available. So our, our incentives are very uh, generous. If for some reason you can't take advantage of our instant discount with your cell phone in the, in the store, 
you can pay the full price for the heat pump water heater, mail us a copy of the receipt with a claim form, and we'll mail you a check for $850. So everybody should be able to participate. And they are. Uh, every 12 minutes, we issue a heat pump water heater rebate. They're extremely popular. And unlike heat pumps and insulation, heat pump water heaters can be installed by anyone, including by yourself or a friend or neighbor, family member. Um, you don't have to use a residential registered vendor. We have a list of them on our website, but anyone can do an installation of a heat pump water heater. So those are the big three. You can go to the next slide. And we also offer very generous rebates for electric vehicles. Um, this is new to us a couple of years ago. Um, for people of any income, we offer a $2,000 rebate for full electric vehicles called battery electric vehicles that, um, that only run on electricity or a $1,000 rebate for plug-in hybrids. Those are the ones you plug in to charge up, but they also have a gas tank. And you, when they run out of electricity, they silently and automatically switch over to gas. Um, kind of the best of death, best of both worlds. And for low income, we do a couple things. One is we offer very generous rebates, 5,500 for a new electric vehicle, $4,000 for a plug-in hybrid. And the big winner is for low income people buying at a participating dealer, they can buy a used electric vehicle or a used plug-in hybrid and get $2,500 back from us. And these are all instant discounts that you would get the, the markdown in the store. People like electric vehicles because they save a lot of money on fuel and maintenance. There isn't very much to maintain an electric vehicle. Um, the first 50,000, I've driven 50,000 miles of my car, and there was just changing the cabin air filter was the only thing that needed to happen. There, there is no oil. Um, there, other than tires, there really isn't much to change. Um, people also like them because they have quick acceleration. They're very, very quiet. It's a little unsettling the first time you start, the car starts to move and you don't actually hear anything. Um, so those are reasons people like electric vehicles. They also um, like them because they reduce CO2 emissions. If you can find a source of solar electricity, there's no CO2 emissions for using the car. And as I mentioned, these incentives that I just talked about are instant discounts and they're available at main participating dealers. For Tesla and Polestar, they don't have dealers anywhere. Um, so you can do a mail-in rebate to, to get those incentives. So we talked about heat pumps, insulation, heat pump, water heaters, electric vehicles. Let's go to the next slide. Appliances, plain and simple, $50 mail-in rebate for NG Star clothes washer, $25 for NG Star room air purifier. Next slide. That's it for rebates. That's, the, that's what people know us best for. We'll do one slide on financing. We go to the next slide. If you um, will pay for part of your job, half of it or 90% of it from an insulation case. Um, if you are looking for a source of funding for the rest of the job, um, we'd encourage you to go to a bank or credit union. Um, if you want, we would be more than happy to lend you the money. We will lend up to $15,000 and our interest rates are either 4.99 or 5.99% APR. We don't have any closing fees, no application fees, no prepayment fees. Um, you can borrow up to 15 years. And as I mentioned before, a $10,000 loan would cost $106 a month. So you can take on some pretty big projects and have it paid for with the energy savings. So the sooner you start, the sooner you end up ahead. So people often ask, what's the payback? And for most of these, there is no payback. You're actually richer at the end of the first month. Um, your energy savings can exceed your lease payments and you get all those other benefits we talked about uh, paid for by energy savings. There's a lot of fine print on our home energy loans. One of them is the borrower must be a main resident. So our rebates are for any house, regardless of where the owner lives, it's for the house, but our loans are for mainers. Um, and the loans are only available for rebate eligible upgrades. So if you need a new roof, this is not a generic home improvement loan. This is a loan to help you afford a project that would qualify for a rebate. They, they are one and the same. Uh, so that's it on home energy loans. Um, and very easy. You can apply 24-7 um, on our website, efficiencymain.com. And we'll get back to you in three business days, letting you know what loan, if any, you qualify for. And we'd love to lend you money if that would help you get the project done. Next slide. Okay, I said we talked about four things. We went over rebates. We just went over financing. 
We've got a lot of tools on our website. I'm going to show you a few right now that I think that I hope would, might be of interest and encourage you to visit efficiencymean.com uh, to, to try these and experiment with the others. Let's take a look at the next slide. Um, kind of a first step. I loved Richard's point about diagnosing before treating. Um, some people come to us and say, you know, um, you guys offer a $500 rebate. I didn't mention that, but we do offer a $500 rebate for a $600 energy assessment with six hours of air sealing. Um, people say, but I don't really know if my house is a good candidate. Um, I, I don't, it's kind of a chick or the egg. I, I'd like to know if it's a good candidate before I start spending money and make it more efficient. People often get confused and think there used to be, they think the energy codes have been around for a long time. They've just been around for a few years. Um, so a 10-year-old house was actually built when there was no energy code in Maine. So this is a quick calculator. It's not perfect. It's not an energy assessment. It's just a quick, bigger than a red box, thumbs up, thumbs down. In this particular example, I keyed in some numbers. A 2,000 square foot home, so you'd have to know how big your house is. Um, uses 800 gallons of oil a year. You'd have to look through your records to find out how much oil you use. And uses $1,000 of electricity per year. You'd have to look at your electric bills. And one quart of wood. You have to know that you just put in those four numbers, click calculate, and this particular example comes up and says, hmm, your house uses 42% more energy than a typical weatherized home. Click here to find a participating energy advisor. So it's that simple. You put in four numbers. If you use more energy sources, you can put in more. Very simple, not, not, not complex. And you can quickly find out this particular house. Yeah, this would be a good candidate. What needs to be done? Well, the calculator can't tell you that, but it just gives you a good idea. There's, there should be some low-hanging fruit. You should be able to benefit from investment in your home. So that's the first tool is the home efficiency calculator. Let's go to the next slide and take another look at another tool on efficiencymain.com. That is the compare home heating cost calculator. This one gets tens of thousands of visits each year, and a lot of them are not even from Maine. So I think this is one of the most popular uh, calculators in the country for what it does. And uh, it's pretty powerful. You put in, um, uh, select what heating system you use, for example, an oil boiler, uh, which you had some good pictures of them. And um, a, it's got a sample price. You hit up and down till the price reflects what you're paying for your oil boiler. And then it prorates all the other heating systems. And it shows you, in this case, what I mentioned before, that heat pumps, a little hard to see, but heat pumps are down the bottom left in this particular sized home would be $1,691 a year. Oil in this particular home would be $4,099 a year. And propane would be $4,914. So you can see roughly heat pumps are about half oil. They're a little less than that in this case. And they're about one third the price of propane. And what this will help you do is try and decide how much am I gonna save switching from oil to heat pumps? In this case, you're going to save over $2,000 a year. Um, this is not an unusual example. If you have propane, that's one of the best opportunities to leave. Uh, propane going here, you'd be saving close to four, I'm mean, close to $3,000 a year. You can pay, pay back a, a heat pump very, very quickly. Remember before I was talking about uh, $52 a month, um, we're talking about uh, $3,000 a year savings. So the home, he, uh, compare home heating cost calculator is a very popular tool. If you want to get technical, you can press some buttons to open up the inside. You can change the assumptions on what the pro, uh, efficiency is of the heating system. You can change the uh, inputs for the cost of electricity or wood or oil. You can play it to your heart's content. It's a calculator and, and you can control it, but it gives you a nice quick estimate as to how much money you can save. Let's take a look at the next slide. Similar to the compare home heating cost, we have a compare water heating cost calculator. Um, and again, you can see that a heat pump, in this case, under $200 is less than half the price of oil. That's what I said, a good rule of thumb is oil is about twice the price of heat pumps. We're talking water now, but it's the same math. And propane is one of the most expensive ways to heat water. Um, and here you can see it's about triple the cost of a heat pump water heater. Um, so we've got on here, heat, I'll read the fine print, heat pump water heater, natural gas, instantaneous natural gas, storage tank, propane instantaneous, oil boiler, um, goes all the way up to electric water heater. The tallest bar there is the electric water heater. Um, so this is where uh, I mentioned you can save $500 a year or $5,000 over 10 years with a heat pump water heater. 
This is why people love keep up water heaters. Lots of water and save up to $5,000. It's, it's a fantastic investment. And as I, hopefully I mentioned, as of today, they're now for sale in Maine for $549 after instant discount. You don't have to wait for your rebate check. So that's the third tool we've got on our website. Let's uh, take a look at the next slide. Um, we've been through three tools. We have several other tools, but those are some nice tools. Just hopefully pique your interest that are available on efficiencymaine.com. And the last one is our installer database, which is actually a tool. Let's take a look at that. It's one of the um, most popular parts of our website. So the next slide, it says installer database. And I realize you may not be able to see this on your screen, but this is on efficiencymain.com. You clicked what service you want, insulation, oil boiler, heat pumps, heat pump water heater, uh, whatever it is you want. You put in your zip code, and then you tell us what distance you wanna search, 10 miles, 20 miles, 30 miles. You can search the whole state if you want. We'd recommend something more like 10 or 25 miles if installer has to drive a long way, so you end up paying for their driving rather than their talents. Um, and, and then a sort by, our default is sort by number of rebates, which is really powerful. We did a study many years ago. We were doing customer satisfaction surveys for jobs. And what we found was the higher satisfaction rating, the more rebates. It's kind of obvious in hindsight, but um, if you call the first three on the list, you'll be talking to the most three, the three most popular in your area. And that yellow button there says questions to ask a registered vendor. If you're not sure what to ask, you're not sure how to pick them. We, we facilitated over 100,000 partnerships between homeowners and installers. We can tell you um, what we found is we don't have bad installers and we don't have bad homeowners. Sometimes we have bad communications. I might call on a vendor and assume that they're gonna do all the paperwork to get me the rebate. They might assume that they're not. The job gets done. I said, we do the paperwork. And they say, no, we don't do that. And we're frustrated with one another. It's not a bad installer. It's not a bad homeowner. We just failed to ask the question. So we've got questions like that um, on our questions to ask a vendor. Um, and this is a great way to find them. They're all independent. We don't pay them. They don't pay us. They don't pay to become a registered vendor. We don't set their pricing. Um, we do make sure that they're certified for their profession, we make sure they're insured, make sure that they've signed a code of conduct as to how they'll treat customers. Again, we've facilitated tens of thousands of, of partnerships between homeowners and, and installers. And we know what homeowners like. We ask them and we put it into our code of conduct. And installers like to do that. They like to make homeowners happy. So you're gonna find some very high, we're very lucky in Maine. We have super high quality installers and hundreds of them. Um, and uh, so that's, we, we get uh, 45,000 times a year, a Mainer goes on to our installer database search and finds vendors near them. Okay, so we've been over rebates, financing, tools, and installers. Let's see the next slide. I was thinking we were near the end. Um, so you can find all these tools, all this information, more information about the rebates and financing on efficiencyname.com, or you can give us a call at this phone number. And that's the end of my slides. Thank you very much, Andy. Thank you both. Those were incredible presentations. So many gems in there that I just want to dive into all of them, but we don't have time to do all of that. So um, let's see. I will say I am in the camp of love my new heat pump hot water heater just got installed this summer and we have so much hot water. It's hotter than ever. We've never run out, which I know are some of the fears, um, but it's been great for us. So, um, and I also wanted to say, Richard, that chart, that um, pyramid chart you showed was super helpful to, to help people figure out how to make those decisions, like what comes first, obviously, safety and health and comfort, those things should all be addressed before we're even beginning to talk about efficiency. So that's, that was really helpful. Um, I would love to start with a, a personal question, which I also saw a couple of of folks also submitted similar questions about wet basements. We have a basement that sometimes gets wet. And I, I know you talked a little bit about encapsulation, Richard. Can you dive into that a little bit more and explain sort of um, what happens to the water after you encapsulate a basement? 
can you use the basement after you encapsulate it? Like, can you still go down there? Does that affect the integrity of the job? Anything that you can add to what, what do we do for people who have wet basements? Well, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. So, so why is water getting in the basement other than the fact that it rains? I mean, I'm just gonna start there. Are there gutters on the building? Uh, is the downspout go away from the building? Um, all the things that an architect and builder do with a new building, if you're arriving at a house that's already built uh, or you're realizing, oh, I've lived here 12 years and I never thought that I could be in charge of this, um, you are deputized to, to take a little analysis and walk around, especially on a heavy rain, rainy day with your umbrella and understand how things move. And there's so many different things with different basements. Uh, I've seen literally streams and wells in basements. Um, I've seen I've seen a lot of different things, but you know, getting getting the drainage of the site improved. Um, the encapsulation just to get that is a last resort. You know, you've looked at the drainage. That's not fixing it. Um, it might be built in a uh, in a spot that's prone to ledge. So it's really tough spot. You know, there's a lot of places in Maine that have ledge, uh, Bath, you know, Bath is built all on ledge and all the basements are kind of uh, contorted and everything. Um, so it, encapsulation is kind of a last resort. Um, if, you're, if your basement normally drains, but gets wet and you can't totally solve it, at, every main basement should have a dehumidifier installed. And the best dehumidifier to install is a heat pump water heater, plus, plus maybe another one to help out when it gets really wet. Um, but the encapsulation is, is kind of like a, a reverse uh, building envelope, uh, hopefully to prevent the evaporation of moisture and it still needs to drain. You need a place for it to drain in the basement. It's just meant to stop some airflow if you have radon in your basement, which happens a lot, mm. happens a lot, you really need a slab or a membrane to suck the radon out before it gets into your house. So it, it's a really convenient um, dual purpose thing. So what I would say to you is, if you don't have a radon test that passed and you haven't tested it in a few years, you should, you should test it. We have these mini earthquakes and sometimes little fissures open up and, and such. Uh, and if you do have radon, then it's straightforward. You need to have a slab with drainage and invest in that. You need to have maybe a, a, va a vapor barrier all sealed in tight and then insulated around the perimeter. Um, but moisture is huge. I, I was at a conference once and this really grabbed me. This, this uh, health occupational health specialist passed around all these straws as we were coming in, little coffee stirrer straws. Ellen Tone was her name. And she gave everyone a straw. I'm like, oh, what's this straw? And she said, everyone try to breathe through that straw. And if you start panicking, you know, you can stop, but try to breathe through it for a minute. And that's what it feels like to have asthma. And wet basements can give you asthma. So you don't want to have the mold and mildew coming up. And I grew up in a house like that. And I, I want to convince my parents to fix their wet, their wet basement. But it's a, it's a very dangerous respiratory trigger to have a wet basement. So dehumidification, first off, radon mitigation. Pretty compelling. <laughs> Thank you. Um, let's move on to another reader question. Do you think that efficiency improvements for the home should take priority over the installation of heat pumps? Could I, could I start that one, Richard? Yeah. Uh, this is uh, talked about a lot in energy efficiency circles. Um, and in the past, with heating systems that couldn't modulate or change their speed, it, it didn't make sense to upgrade the heating system, let's say it was a, a, a hundred units of heat, 100 MMBTU per hour, 100, and you put in a new heating system that was sized at the inefficient house, and then you made the house efficient. So maybe it only needed, for example, a 50 MMBTU per hour heating system. 
Well, now you have the wrong heating side, the wrong size heating system in the house. And uh, oil boilers can only go two speeds, full speed and off. So you've now put one in that's too big. So it, it has to cycle. It turns on and it's a zero efficiency when it first starts and it's 1%, 2%, 3%. It runs long enough. It'll get up to something, depending on the efficiency, to a peak of maybe 80%. But then you shut it off. And then you turn it back on. You're at zero again, 1%, 2%. And then you shut it off. A short cycle, you might only get a 50% or less uh, boiler if you put the wrong size. So if you're going to put an oil boiler or weatherize, you should weatherize first and reduce the heat load and then put in a small oil boiler. That has changed now with heat pumps because they can go a, a wide range of speeds. So if the house needs 20,000 BTUs per hour, it'll run at 20,000 BTUs per hour. But if the house is then weatherized and it only needs 10,000 BTUs per hour, or half that, it runs at half speed. It doesn't cycle. It starts up in October and it runs till the end of March or April and shuts up and it modulates. So a, it is not as big a risk of a wrong sized heat pump. So I, I think it depends on the heating system you're putting in. If you're going to put in a combustion system, then you don't want to put in oversized when you want to reduce the demand from the envelope first and then put in the heating system. But if you're going to put in a heating a, a heat pump, you could do whatever is convenient for you. You won't be making a, a mistake. You don't have to replace or you won't, you won't be sorry. I'll go the wrong order. Be my answer. Richard, what would you add to that? I, I, I would totally agree. Um, you, you, hit, you hit the nail on the head, Andy. I'll, I'll supplement there that um, at least the way the question was asked, efficiency improvements, uh, going from very low efficiency oil boiler to a heat pump is an inch efficiency improvement, uh, well, which is an amazing you know, shift. Uh, you know, the only supplement I would add to that is sometimes people self-diagnose. They're like, oh, I have a headache. I must have brain cancer. I'm going to call a surgeon, <laughs> you know, and, and I have run across some situations where there's actually no insulation in a roof upstairs because that's where they're working during the pandemic. And they never knew there was any, they never even thought there'd be no insulation. I mean, it's super hot up there and boy, do they feel comfortable with a heat pump. And in that case, um, it, it's important that hopefully the heat pump installer thinks to check, is there insulation up there? You know, it's, it's a little bit like, oh, my, my car won't go. And if you're missing a tire and instead replace the engine, you know, it might get you down the road. But um, in general, yeah, heat pumps are a game changer and they are an efficiency improvement. Thank you for adding that. Um, next question, if funds are limited, is it better to start by insulating the roof or the basement? All right, I can, I can, I can start with that. Um, I, I would challenge open, being open to anything because this, this is a little bit of self-diagnosis. Oh, I have a headache. Do I have brain, you know, do I have brain cancer, you know? First, we have to figure out what really is going on. And if funds are limited, it's really clear. You have to be super clear on what you're hoping to get out of it. What's truly important to you? And I have seen families with a newborn coming where if funds are limited, they're going to surround that baby with, with a blanket of comfort. If funds are limited and you have to work from home, you got to be comfortable during the day. Your work environment is really critical. If funds are limited and you have an asthma trigger um, in the basement, you know, so that that really uh, is a big one. But there's clearly opportunities that are super, super straightforward, like a heat pump with a great rebate and great financing and a huge energy efficiency. Like you can grab that. Um, uh, if you do, if you're choosing between the uh, the attic or was it the attic or the the roof or the basement, it really depends. You know, if the basement has a little bit of insulation, it's not perfect. Um, then that's not as big of a gain to go from some to a lot. And same with your attic, uh, as long as there's air sealing going from some to a lot. But if you got no insulation on the foundation wall and you actually have heat down there. Uh, or if you have no insulation in your attic, like my first house that I bought in Rockland in 2004, it had no insulation in the attic. I rarely run across those, but I bought it and I got into this business. Start where there's no insulation and you can go, go more. So it's not a straightforward answer, but being clear on what your vision and goals are 
Um, it's just like if you have 10 bucks and you're going into the store, are you having a birthday party? Are you just getting lunch? You know, it's really, you got to be clear. Yeah, really. I'd like to, could I, could I add to that, Heather? Yeah. Um, the question's fair, but I, I love uh, Richard's answer. I would also challenge people to ask if funds are limited, then how long do you want to keep wasting money on oil? I, I've already explained that with good pricing from our installers, rebates for efficiency main paying half or 90%, financing the rest, it will many of these upgrades will more than pay for themselves immediately. So my question would be, if funds are limited, how much longer are you going to keep wasting them? Um, I'm so cheap. I can't, it, it kills me, the thought of someone short on funds holding off on saving money on energy. So I would, I would uh, suggest that the game has changed with the rebates from efficiency main, where we will pay half and lend the other half, and you're already paying more than it costs to improve your house. You're just not, you're just paying for it in propane or oil. So I hope people would kind of rethink, uh, the question's valid, but um, the game has changed when it comes to uh, being able to afford. I would say if funds are, you have a lot of extra money, you might consider continuing with an inefficient house. But if you're trying to save money, then that would be a very good time to invest in, in uh, switching your cash flow over to a loan that, as Richard has taught me, will eventually get paid off. In the meantime, you'll be a little bit richer every month. That it would make sense to start with the assessment and then minimizing. Yes. Especially with your five hundred dollar rebate. <laughs> yes. yes. Yeah. All right. Let's see. Where are we? Um, there was a somebody wanted to know a little bit more about retrofits of older three story multifamily homes. They didn't specify the exact question, but um, does somebody want to take a stab at that? I, I, I recognize the questioner and I've been to their house so I can maybe uh, fill in. And it, 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 is, it is hard when you have a multi-story home. And I, I had that diagram of the tall building, which is kind of like a multi-story home. And um, an assessment is really, really helpful. But, but some of the things that we find, especially uh, in places like Portland and perhaps Lewiston, uh, there's a lot of them that are three separate stories that are all identical. And sometimes it's a landlord situation that rents uh, out to tenants, sometimes living, uh, living there, and sometimes they're all condoized. Now, if they're condoized, each floor belongs to a different person. Um, the laws of physics don't know um, that the first floor person owns one third of the whole building. It just gives all the cold to the person on the first floor if you have any issues and the leaks and people on the top floor could open the windows because it's too hot up there and that dress drives more cold. So it's kind of like being a Siamese twin. You know, you have to coordinate with your other third, uh, two thirds or your other half. Uh, but, but the stack nature of it uh, is an issue, less of an issue in townhouse situations but still can be an issue in townhouse situations because you share a wall. So if all the cold air is leaking through there, or if every time your neighbor cooks garlic, you can smell it and affects your indoor air quality. You know, you, you are Siamese twins. So um, they're, they're definitely tricky. And this is where, you know, a little bit of testing, but most importantly, coordinating with, you know, if it's one landlord, then you're all on the same team. Um, but it definitely can be complex when they're all different owners and it is possible to do, but it's, they're fun. Thank you. I just want to add uh, to Richard's uh, golden comments there that multifamilies, um, one through four units are eligible for residential rebates. So the building would be eligible for up to $5,000 rebate insulation each unit within the building are eligible for $1,200 worth of rebates for heat pumps. So that would be up to $3,600 in heat pumps. And each unit is eligible for a heat pump water heater rebate actually every year. Um, so that would be a water heater for every unit, a uh, up to two heat pumps for every unit, 
and then uh, $5,000 of rebate for installation for the whole building. So as long as it's one to four units, um, those all those all apply. And heat pumps and heat pump water heaters would apply for any building, no matter how big they are. But installation would be limited to one to four. Uh, so that, that would be my addition for the three-story multifamily. Great, thank you. Question, what would you do if you are moving? In other words, what are the easiest improvements to make before you have furniture and personal items in the house? What would you recommend for this Richard, person? Richard, you start. Um, well, well, first of all, if you have a house that has something that looks leaky from an interior finish and by that i mean like natural wood tongue and groove or a lot of cracks that you can see that look so beautiful it's real wood those are super leaky and they they require a lot of space to fix to fix right so that that's one thing that that, that comes to mind but keep in mind that most contractors that work in the efficiency main program they go to house after house that is fully lived in and guess what that attic in order to get into that attic, you're going to the master bedroom closet through a hole about this size and all the shoes have to come out and you know, your wedding dress in a box up in the corner comes out and all yep. that stuff comes out. And, and I think the crews uh, really take it to heart to, to be very careful and respectful. So um, it can be really hard, but I guess the best thing is, is if you can time it and, and actually get someone to come out before you move in, but don't over, you know, if you have to wait months, it, it is worth waiting months. Sadly, you know, it, there's just a lot of demand and not enough uh, experienced people, but that's building, you know, it, that, that may improve. I just be patient, but I think we're good at, we're good at treading lightly. <laughs> Thank you. Anything to add to that one, Andy? No, thank you. All right. Um, somebody was asking for clarification on the comment about indoor air circulation. Um, I think this might have been you, Andy. Does this mean there's no fresh air intake when using heat pumps? If not, how do you get fresh air into a well-insulated home with a tight envelope? Great question. Can I start that, Richard? Oh, th there's there is often confusion, and I hope I didn't just create it. I'm glad the question got asked. Heat pumps pump heat or cooling into a house, but not fresh outdoor air. The two most, well, the three most common ways of getting fresh air, one is leaks, which is not our recommended, but it is actually the, the top source of leak of uh, fresh air and nasty air. Um, and another is um, called exhaust only ventilation which is usually just a bathroom fan with a that's very efficient bathroom fan with a timer switch um, and i know i have one in my house um, you take the plate off and i have two little dials one is how long do you want the fan to run after you turn off the shower light and so we've got it running for a half hour when we're, we turn the light off and leave and 30 minutes later the fan stops but it's dried the, the bathroom out the other little dial is how many minutes each hour would you like us to, would you like the fan to run so ours happens to be set 10 minutes. So every now and then it may have happened during this webinar for 10 minutes, the fan quietly comes on and exhausts air. Now that doesn't control where the air is coming in. So that is not the, the best way. Um, the best way to get fresh air into a house is an energy recovery ventilator or a heat recovery ventilator called ERV or HRV. And that has got ductwork that takes the moist air out of usually the kitchen or the bathroom and sends it outside and it brings fresh air in to other rooms, bedrooms or living room. It does it very wisely as the warm air is going out and the cold air is coming in, it exchanges the heat, not the air, not the contaminants. Only the fresh air stays pure and the wet air goes outside. It'll take the heat from the exhaust air into the uh, fresh incoming air. And they claim that you can save, um, take about 80% of that energy that would be lost could be introduced to the incoming air. So the incoming air is a little, little more comfortable and you reduce your energy loss by up to 80%. And, and one of them also will allow some of the moisture that was going out in, in, a, in a dry winter. Um, you can nicely recover some of that moisture and, and make sure you don't get uh, overly dried out. So those would be the three ways, leaks, which we don't recommend, exhaust only, which is not the best way, um, or it's called a balanced system that inhales and exhales very, very thoughtfully.
to save 80% of the energy loss. Richard, would you add to that? Oh, that was that was great. And I'll just add a few a few Please. things. Make tight vent right is is a good is a good adage. And uh, I can speak from personal experience. Um, I did install a balanced heat recovery ventilator uh, at my other house. I don't have it in my current house, but it just makes you feel healthy. You 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 you, you have the air. It, you know, the kids will be bouncing off the bed. So, you know, maybe you turn it down at night. To, no, I'm just kidding. But, but, uh, but it really does add a lot. And, uh, and you might ask, why would I spend all this money to tighten up the home? And then I have to spend all this money to get air into the home. And, and the answer is partly that in the winter, you have no control. It's like through the roof air leakage. So if you get it under control, um, it will help you in the winter, but in the summer, even a leaky house or in the fall, there's no air moving because there's no temperature difference. So it really makes a lot of sense. But just know that it's not, like everything in life, it's not that straightforward. If you don't have outdoor air quality, you can have indoor air quality. So if you're right next to the highway, or if you happen to set up your barbecue smoker grill right underneath the intake, which you know I, I, I did, you're going to smell dinner and smoke in the bedroom so uh but they're really fantastic i'm glad that question came up thank you both um there is a question about whether the rebates apply to a new home purchase when the home is in need of a full gut rehab so i guess that's probably not a brand new home purchase but new to them home purchase um how do the rebates apply in those cases the rebates are uh, funded from sources that um, uh, that fund us to drive energy efficiency. So we have to be able to say that if not for the rebates, the project wouldn't have happened. So if you're going to do a gut rehab to the extent that you need a building permit, if you're building or, or with a permit on a house, you have to bring it up to energy code. So we wouldn't be able to give you a rebate for something that was required by code and claim that the rebate was the was the reason it was done. Um, if you are just doing insulation, so if you're taking down walls and you need a building permit, but if you're just insulating an old home, that's what we do for a living. And we love nothing more than to pay rebates, the bigger, the better uh, for, for any house. Hopefully that helps. Richard, you, you may have something to add to that. No, I, I think you nailed it. Okay. Great. I am just realizing the time. There's so much, so many questions here. I'm going to ask one last question because I think it is one that, um, Andy, you may be able to answer with a, a quick one sentence. And that is, why doesn't Efficiency Maine offer rebates on ducted heat pumps? Can you do that one, Andy? Uh, yes, it's a trick question. We <laughs> do offer rebates on ducted heat pumps every day. And we like that. They do have to be efficient. But we there's nothing we'd like more. We do we do that probably every day. Yes, they, they are definitely eligible. Excellent. That was a softball. Um, well, thank you all. I would like to once again thank everyone who joined us this evening for this episode of the Home and Energy Chats. I hope that you learned some helpful new information. Uh, thank you again to our sponsors, Royal River Heat Pumps and Senegal Construction Services. Thank you to Rain Rainer, who managed everything so beautifully tonight and also helped to step in for me and uh, my voice, which thank goodness is still with me. Um, and a big thank you to our panelists, to Richard and Andy, who are just a wealth of information. And I'm so happy that you both were able to join us tonight. We're so lucky to have you um, and uh, really appreciate all of your contributions. If you do have any questions that um, we did not get to today, um, I do encourage you to reach out to um, Efficiency Maine. They have uh, great customer service staff who can help you, direct you to folks who may be able to answer your questions. Um, and also want to let you know that we did record this session and it will be available on our website in the next couple of days at greenmainhomes.com. And um, we have three more episodes happening this fall. So check out our website for that. We're doing one on the Inflation Reduction Act. 
Um, we have one on embodied carbon in building materials, and we have one on solar and batteries coming up. So check out our website for the dates on those. And lastly, you will see a brief survey pop up when we close the webinar. We love to hear your feedback on today's session to help us craft our future programming. So thank you again, everybody. Thank you, Richard and Andy, and thank, thank you, you to Rain. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you all. Thanks, Heather. Thanks, Rain. Thank you, Richard.